Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House in Naples on a, you know, again, I hear the complaints in the comments. It's 40 below in Edmonton. One poor guy told me his left eyelid froze shut when he was on a morning run. And I get it. I mean, you know, if you're doing that, nobody wants to hear somebody bitching about 75 degree morning weather in Florida. Fair enough. Some people don't want to hear the weather report at all. And I couldn't argue with that either. I mean, you know, you tune in to look at a car review and some curmudgeonly old bastard is talking about the shitty Florida weather. It's just not what you expect. Uh, but sorry, you know, I got to be me. And, you know, long before I was doing videos, I was bitching about the Florida weather and I'll be doing it long after. So uh, it's just one of those things. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a hot day. We're heading to Sebring today. We've got a little, you know, spec Miata race over the weekend. I looked at the weather report up there. It's going to be hot and raining, either or. So, uh, you know, rain races are fun because, you know, I like hitting walls, but not everybody does. Uh, but the heat, uh, it sucks. And especially in February. I mean, this is the kind of thing you live for, these little cool days in February. Uh, so we're racing to get it all together. I've got a big pile of crap over there that was in this car this morning. Before I go for a ride, i got to put it in. In, but uh, I also get nailed with bird shit instantly Inst and, and I'll put a little clip in at the end uh, showing that and what's going on uh, it was uh, upsetting enough I even forgot the damn name of the Remington shotgun I had but uh, we'll get into that but okay here it is so you know, <laughs> just for the sake of uh, the people in the comment section the ones who came here for the review uh, I'm sure somebody will put in video on the car starts here so here it is. This is a 2006 Mercedes-Benz CLS 500 Coupe. And I'm not kidding about that. Mercedes called it a coupe, even though it has four doors and is quite obviously a sedan. Uh, Mercedes-Benz advertised and sold this as a coupe, and that's fine. Uh, actually, they put it out to compete with the BMW 6 Series. Uh, it was placed in just about the exact same market point uh, in between the, uh, you know, the 5 and the 7, and for Mercedes, in between the E and the S. And I'll say this much about this car. When I first saw it, I wasn't really really following new cars. Not at all. No, no car magazines, no shows. Wasn't really looking at the internet. I was wrapped up in whatever the hell I was doing at the time. It was mostly old stuff, and that's where my head was. And I'm driving down the road in Naples. You know, you see a lot of fancy shit driving around Naples, and uh, all of a sudden, a you know, at the time, I didn't know, again, had no idea what it was. A CLS pulls up next to me, and I... I I was again, my jaw dropped. I mean, I was blown away by this car. And, you know, in 06, I was a pretty curmudgeonly bastard, too. So uh, I'm not easily wowed or easily impressed with a. Uh, uh, with style or with haute couture or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but this car did it for me, man. I thought it was the baddest looking thing that I had ever seen. I thought it was S-Class level. I thought Mercedes was going crazy and I loved it. And uh, I still love it today. And I have this feeling that, you know, 20 years from now, you all, people always say, what's going to be collectible? What's going to run across Barrett Jackson and do pretty good money? Uh, I think these first gen CLSs are going to. I really, really do. And that's not just the coronavirus whiskey talking. Uh, I can tell you that because my little flask was almost empty. I only got like half a shot this morning, so who knows if I'm going to be able to keep going, but we'll give it a try. Uh, so anyway, this thing came out with this incredibly low swooping greenhouse, these slits of a, you know, side window with the uh, beautiful curvature, this stubby little trunk, this long S-class-ish front end. And I thought, what the hell is Mercedes-Benz up to? Uh, I mean, it looked different from every Mercedes I have ever seen. Uh, you know, the E-class, uh, you know, the, look at Dalton's detailing. I also read somewhere that I'm hard on Dalton in the videos. Somebody pointed that out. Yeah, I tell you what. You hire him, okay, and you work, have him work with you for, I'll give you 10 days. I don't think it's going to take nearly that long, but you have to do it for 10 days and see if you don't end up with the exact same commentary that I'm coming up with. Just see, see if his smirking face as he delivers substandard work to you with a big giggle, happy, happy that he's troubled you. Uh, see if that doesn't, you know, ride your ass like a... 
like a whatever. Anyway, so it, it, back to the CLS. You know, the styling of it, to me, was gorgeous. Later on, I read stuff about it. They call it the German Jaguar. Uh, it's one of the first uh, Mercedes-Benz, if not the first, you know, uh, certainly post coach built, so, you know, back in the days when you'd order a chassis from someone and some coach builder would put it together for you. Mercedes did that with Maybach and, uh, you know, some other companies, uh, Pin and Farina even. Uh, but, um, you know, this is mass produced. This is very different. This is a factory car. And it's the first Mercedes that really zeroed in on having style over function. It's just not the Mercedes thing. You know, that's Jaguar's thing. And I think that's why they call this the German Jaguar. So why did Mercedes build it? Because really, it honestly sort of came out of nowhere. Uh, it wasn't incredibly innovative in the sense of uh, the underpinnings. It's basically an E-Class underneath the, uh, uh, the W211 E-Class. Uh, E500, truly. And, you know, so what were they doing? I, I think what they did was had a quick little experiment. You know, if we come up with this thing that's very un Mercedes like, is it going to sell? Is it going to be popular? Uh, if it's not, we can just quietly uh, make it go away. And uh, if it is popular, then we can build on it. Well, it turned out to be pretty damn popular, uh, enough so to spawn some imitators. You know, BMW and their Grand Coupe series, uh, even the Volkswagen CC and uh, some other stuff all came along that was very much inspired by the design of this car. And uh, it has its detractors. There's a lot of people out there who lament the rear headroom. <laughs> you can't blame them for that. They wonder why the hell anyone would call it a coupe. Uh, they think the back end is stubby and droopy and weird and doesn't match the front. Uh, you know, they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Uh, you know, there's detractors for supermodels, too. Some obviously stunning woman will walk down a catwalk and, you know, there'll be two guys in the bow. Oh, she's got, you know, she's got one mismatched knee or, you know, that that boob looks weird or, you know, I mean, there's always going to be some people who detract, but I think the general consensus on this car uh, was that it was absolutely gorgeous. And I'm going to stick to that, uh, particularly in the sport package version, which I think was better looking than the, uh, the one without, even if it added like seven grand to the price tag. Uh, these cars were expensive, again, between the S and the uh, E, and they came in on the, what, seventy to $80,000 range by the time they were equipped. Uh, so it kind of put it out of reach of most of the common people like me, but uh, they've, you know, they've come down considerably. And frankly, I think they make a pretty damn good used car uh, that you can buy for reasonable money and uh, enjoy the hell out of, because they do have E-class level reliability uh, even if it does have a few S tidbits around it. Uh, I do like the L-shaped uh, light swoopy by Xenon. I like the mesh grill in the bottom that's designed to look uh, a little bit like a Formula One car. Uh, I think that was the spirit you know, Mercedes got into F1 and they're really hawking it up with all their uh, McLaren Mercedes and then AMG Mercedes. and uh, So that does look like the uh, lower uh, wing on an F1 car. Little fogs in there. You've got five-star twin spoke, 18 inch AMG alloys, uh, a very interesting body line that swoops off the wheel well in the front and continues on to the back. I think it's a bit too pronounced, but eh, whatever. Wipe all this mist and fingerprints off. Uh, this is an interesting car in that it has 26,000 miles. Uh, not easy to find these things with such low miles. And uh, when it came along, I had to snap it up. But you know, Mercedes always got a lot of Again, here are my theories on this thing. Number one, Jaguar has always built uh, what I think many people consider to be a more beautiful car uh, than the stuff the Germans come out with. The Jaguar XJ, which competes with these big uh, S-classes and 7 Series and, you know, that sort of thing, is a very handsome car, very attractive for less money than the Mercedes, uh, and usually not with as much content, but it does have an elegance and a richness that the Mercedes-Benz lacked. And I think Mercedes got jealous of that and they wanted a piece of it, and uh, thus the CLS. Secondary to that, I think they looked at their numbers and found out that their international crime syndicate numbers were falling considerably from the days of the 140. I don't think the 220, the uh, S-Class that replaced the 140 S-Class, had the same appeal uh, to the criminal underworld. And uh, so, you know, they probably saw their... Uh, you know, Lithuanian crime syndicate numbers dropping, their uh, drug cartel 
South American drug cartel numbers dropping, the New York mobster, the, you know, the Czechoslovakian gangsters, the Russian mobsters, the Japanese mobsters, all of them started buying BMWs and Audis, which really pissed Mercedes off. Uh, so they had to come up with something uh, that would appeal to, you know, people who carried machine guns for a living and uh, had very little sense of humor, and the CLS was it. Uh, so uh, I think you saw a lot of these things running around Eastern Europe with uh, very unfriendly looking dudes inside and lots of firepower all around. And uh, they got that uh, they got that market back. So good for Mercedes. Uh, one thing I will say is you wouldn't see the Pope showing up in a CLS. <clears throat> you know, you're just not. This is not a car that's going to be driven by the good guy in a movie. It's going to be driven by the evil villain almost every time. Uh, you know, like Range Rovers, they're driven by two types of people. Evil British villains and, you know, blonde bitchy soccer moms with money. Uh, they're the only two people who really drive Range Rovers. Well, ditto the CLS. I mean, they're driven pretty much by old, well-to-do guys with a sense of style and, uh, of course, Lithuanian mobsters. But, all right, let's just get into this car. I'm gonna, this is gonna be a short video. I got so much crap to do today. And I said, there's all my crap over there with a the cat. It's probably pissing on it. Anyway, to open the trunk, you pitch that little guy up. And there you see it has a pretty big trunk. Uh, again, because this has the W211 underpinnings, and that has a pretty big trunk, so too does the CLS. And uh, the way they've dipped down the uh, entry, uh, you know, overhang, whatever you want to call it, it's pretty easy to load, too. Uh, while we're here, you also see those twin AMG twice pipes you get with the sport package. Uh, do like the LED swoopy, uh, overcomplicated tail lamps. They appeal to me, even if they look ridiculous in some ways. Uh, your infant containment net shit in here because it's got uh, this hump. I don't know what that's covering, but I don't know what Mercedes is thinking. And again, that's part of that form over function deal. You're never going to stuff an infant in there successfully uh, without, um, you know, without giving them some discomfort. So it wouldn't bother me, but I think it'll bother most people. Uh, but anyway, there it is. And uh, over here, you've got a, I don't know, behind this thing is probably the DV drive for the nav. And then under here, you've got your toolkit. And underneath that panel is the spare tire. There's Peter leaving. He was very troubled, very pissed with me because I had to bring all that crap for the race to load the motor home. Uh, he ended up driving the uh, Toyota Solera, which, yeah, there's the finger. Knew it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. He thought the C-Class was giving him troubles. Uh, now he's driving a, a 12, 13-year-old uh, Toyota Solera with the top down, which surprises me. Probably just didn't feel like removing the boot after the photos uh, because now he's on display. So I love it. He looks like he's a reasonable person. Okay, here's part of the magic of the CLS. Uh, even if this motor is now a bit antiquated, frankly, I'm happy it's a bit antiquated because it doesn't have all, you know, the whole thing has moved towards fuel mileage. I'm hearing rumors about everything going electric in four years. I don't even want to think about it. I'm, not, I'm going to pretend it's not happening. Uh, but this is a very tried and true Mercedes 5 liter V8, 302 horsepower, about what a four cylinder puts out today, but oodles of low end torque. I mean, uh, this torque has a, it's a flatter curve than uh, the, 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 God, I mean, my analogy game is very, very weak. I just don't want to do something cliched. But anyway, it's flat as hell. It's just flat. I mean, it's flatter than the uh, EKG reading on um, on Disco. So anyway, there it is. There's my analogy. Uh, it's a fantastic engine. Very, by today's standards, quite basic. Uh, made it to a seven-speed uh, uh, G-Tronic, Shift-Tronic, whatever Mercedes calls it, doesn't really matter. Uh, automatic, which is as many speeds as I ever want to see in a transmission. I prefer five, but this one has seven, fine. I'll take it, but don't give me any more. Don't give me these new 11-speed stupid things. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's part of what makes the E-Class great. Also an engine that powers the S, and it's more than enough to hurdle this thing down the road. Uh, zero to 60 times, or... Uh, I believe in the high fours, quarter mile times in the 14s. Uh, it's a quick, quick car uh, with, uh, you know, it's not insane, but it certainly is enough and uh, it's a joy to drive. Uh, really, really happy with the power plan in this thing. Have a look in the back seat. 
So here are some of the complaints on that car. Is when you get in, you're going to club your head on that. Well, I mean, if you own it, who the hell cares? You're driving. So, you know, whoever goes back there, the kids, the Canadians, screw them. You know, push them in the way a cop does. Push their head down as, as they enter. Uh, you know, once they're in there, they're going to be pretty chipper unless they're 6'2", and then they're slouching because their head hits the top. Uh, but otherwise, you're in the front. You're behind the wheel. Who gives a crap? Let them hang out. Uh, it's a true four-seater. There's nobody sitting on the hump. It's got its own climate control, so they'll be happy about that. Uh, you've got this big swoopy uh, place to put all your little handguns and clips and bags of narcotics and everything your Lithuanian gangster needs. Uh, the two passengers, they're going to have to fight over that one cup holder uh, unless the center armrest is down, and then it will have three cup holders. So uh, you can be uh, two-fisting it in this thing. And there's another spot to put more uh, stuff, you know, your little 9 millimeters, even a probably a 357, a small frame could fit in there. And uh, then there's a nice place to put in your assortment of pills or, you know, bags of coke or whatever it is the gangsters need these days. I don't know what they're doing now. That was back in the 80s. Uh, door panel treatment, very nice, very simple. All this French stitch stuff that continues around it into the dash. Uh, little pop-out ashtrays, which again, your crime syndicate guys are going to need. Uh, frameless glass, which I quite like. And uh, again, just a roof line that's incredible. It's like the thing they used to fire arrows out of in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's got keyless go, so you can lock it with that button, unlock it by putting your hand on it. You know, every Hyundai has that now, but back in 06, that was kind of a nice feature. Uh, you also have these lovely chrome caps on it. Now, even if it's mass-produced, this car does harken a little bit to me back to the earlier Mercedes that I was much more fond of, the real stodgy uh, vintage stuff. Uh, you've got your traditional Mercedes switches here, mirrors, memory seats, uh, oval window controls. Uh, a lot of stuff was oval in this generation Mercedes. You've got Harman Kardon sound. You've got these very... <laughs> okay, here's an argument that I have. All I've done is open a door. That's it. That's all I've done. Why do I need a warning to not forget my key? How can I forget my key? It's in my pocket. It's not in the car. What the hell is their problem? I mean, I get that car companies want to nanny you. I get that they want to do things for you. You know, we had that Buick the other day where it put its seatbelt on for you if you wanted it to. Stop it, man. Let us just do what we're going to do. Like, at least give us four minutes. Uh, or at least until we put it in drive to get our shit together without the goddamn German nannies beeping at you and giving you reminders. I, I just... Uh... Anyway, I like the chrome entry cells. Very, very nice stuff. You've got a little couple. Oh, let's just hop in and grab the keys. I've unlocked it and locked it. Two keys with that, which is nice. All right, so we can fire it up, stick our key in here, give it a twist. Oh, God. Yeah, we got 80s on 8 there. Uh, okay, so what do we have here? We've got um, uh, we've got a very nice little instrument cluster that's reminiscent of the E-Class, but not quite the same. Uh, you see it's 68. It feels a little warmer than that. It also has this little chrome trim around it, which I think is partially what distinguishes the CLS from the E, and this French stitched leathery, probably vinyl, but it looks leathery, uh, up on top of the dash, along with this big swoopy piece of wood, uh, which looks to me like walnut or something in this. I think it's optional, and it's glossy, which I like, but I think in later years they made it dull. Uh, you also have this big swoopy looking climate control uh, thing underneath, which let me turn the air on a little bit. That's going to be nice. Um, oh, I forgot keyless go. I could have just started it by putting my foot on the brake and tapping that uh, little button on top of the shifter, but I forgot. Uh, okay, so we've got um, Mercedes-Benz command unit. Uh, that gives your navigation, gives you your radio, your satellite. That's I don't think this has a camera. And then that doesn't, not no six. Uh, you also have a pretty cool little hidden CD changer underneath this panel. You can see Dalton did a fantastic job wiping the wood down. What a little bastard. 
Anyway, a little hidden CD changer under there with your hot seats or your cool seats, and apparently you can have them both on at the same time. I don't know how that doesn't confuse the hell out of the car. Uh, back there is a rear sunscreen. You press that and you keep your back seat passengers all very chipper. Uh, this unlower the rear headrests. This unlocks and unlocks the car. Uh, electronic stability program, that's your traction control. Uh, again, Mercedes-Benz command unit. You've got comfort and standard setting on the transmission. Uh, you've got airmatic suspension and you've got uh, ride height uh, uh, raising and again, you know, I know I've said this in the last few videos, but it's really really important in the CLS to know uh, You know if you need to drive over a dead person somebody that you've just killed in a gang war You don't want to screw up your ground effects. You press this uh, You'll see vehicle rising And you can hear the uh, air compressor working. Let me get out and show you that <clears throat> So there you see we're getting all this air in the front wheel well and all this clearance under the front, which is nice. So now the head is going to fit nicely under the bumper, and you don't have to sweat going to the dealership to get that replaced. Uh, but it does look silly when your CLS has the same ride height as Bigfoot, so we're going to get that right back down. Uh, then we've got the Airmatic setting. So you've got uh, Sport 1, Airmatic DC. I think it's Airmatic 2 or ADC 2. What do we do with the... Then, okay, then we've got uh, Sport 2, which is a little more sporty, and then we've got Comfort. Uh, if I really had to break it down, what you've got here is uh, sporty, comfortable, and then more comfortable, you know, more so than, you know, if you're in a Corvette and you start screwing with suspension settings, uh, you're going to jar your fillings out at the race one, not so much in the Mercedes. Uh, up here, you've got self-dimming mirror with your home link stuff. You've got uh, nice big unprogrammed. Okay, I'm going to turn this into a little how-to video on Mercedes. When you push the thing back and it does this, this happens every time you change a battery often sometimes the windows as well and you're only getting it to go back an inch at a time you get it all the way back and you hold it hold that switch then you get it all the way forward and you hold it there you go now you get back hit it once and it is now programmed. So if you get in your Mercedes E-Class CMSS and the uh, sun, oh, I love it, God, and the sunroof is doing this one inch at a time thing, uh, that's how you program it. Okay, we've got a glove box over here, a nice set of books. I don't know if we have a sticker in here. I'm just calling me. We're gonna have to wait. Let's see what's in here. I'm getting there. On, for the love of God. All right, so what do we have? We have, uh, you know, a telephone book sized, uh, uh, whatever the hell it is. We've got um, you know, your command, your service, your DVD, your XM, more stuff. All this is now in the dash. You can't even get paper books anymore. They're all uh, set up to be inside that. No window sticker. That's a shame. Would have been fun to see how much this cost. I'd say it was a pretty expensive version. Uh, but anyway, I guess a useful glove box if you can fit all that crap in there. Uh, then you've got this in here, which is where there would have been a phone in some cases. You have a thing Dalton didn't put down properly. Oh, for the love of God. I'll get that later. Uh, but anyway, a nice little area to store stuff. And it opens up from either side, which is a weird bit of engineering. And then your cup holders that, that can be raised and lowered with the push of a button. Uh, you do have an ashtray, of course, for the uh, the triads and the drug cartels. They're all going to want that uh, that smoking convenience. Let's go. For, oh God, I got to put all my crap in here. I'm not coming back after the test drive, so. All right, I'm going to pause it here so I can load the car up with the stuff, and then we'll go for a spin. All right, so crap inside, and off we go. You know, I cannot tell you how much preparation goes into these weekends, these race weekends. Uh, in terms of the car, in terms of the RVs now, the trailer, the packing, uh, it takes a ridiculous amount of time and energy to get it all ready. And uh, then you go out and race for 10-minute <laughs> sessions, like 12 of them, and you're done. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, what my mom used to bitch about back in the day with Thanksgiving. You know, she'd spend 
like a week prepping everything, ordering stuff from the butchers, the side dishes, this, that, the other. And then a pack of animals would sit down to the beautifully set table and ravish it within, I don't know, 12 seconds. The entire meal was done and everyone was asleep on the couch or playing video games or whatever it is people did. Oh, look at that window. <sighs> anyway, um... So that's it. That's the race weekend stuff. But anyway, nobody really cares about all that. So back to the car. So the CLS drives a lot like an E-Class because, frankly, it is an E-Class underneath the 211. We talked about that. Um, you know, that said, it does have a lot of S-Class bits, but, you know, so did the E500. And one could argue that this car and the E500 sort of competed with each other. But, uh, eh, I think Mercedes was just trying shit out. Uh, but anyway, the steering is rack and pinion and it's nice, it's, you know, variable assist. It somehow manages to feel maybe even a little nicer and more predictable than it does in the E-Class. Uh, it has a brake by wire, which I don't like because I think it's harder to modulate when you're really pushing things, but who the hell is pushing things that often in the car they're driving to the country club? Uh, and the brakes are, uh, of course, quite strong. Uh, it does have brake assist and emergency braking and all that safety crap Mercedes likes to put in stuff. And uh, I guess they work fine, even if I'm not a fan of brake by wire. Um, I'm glad it doesn't have steer by wire, and I'm really glad it doesn't have that shut off at the traffic light crap that all the car makers had to do to meet cafe standards. Hate it. It's one of my least, even more than the autonomous driving crap. I hate that shut off at the traffic light stuff. You know, when I was coming up in the business, I had to drive all these old turds all the time. And, uh, you know, you'd go to the auction, you'd buy some crappy old LeBaron convertible or something, you'd be driving at home, you're hoping everything's okay. Uh, the thing would shut off at the uh, traffic light, you'd go into a panic. Uh, well, you know, now in these new cars, when that happens, uh, the same, you know, engram had, the same shit happens, I freak out. Um, you know, even though it's meant to shut off, it doesn't feel like it is, so. Uh, I just hate it. But anyway, uh, power, lots of it all through the torque curve. Very, very nice in that regard. Um, steering nice. Again, brakes decent, although brake by wire, not a fan. What else can I say? Uh, it goes where you point it. You can steer with the throttle, which I like. Uh, in some ways, it just drives like a... Um, uh, you know, like a Corvette or a V8 Camaro or something. It's it's a real German muscle car, this thing. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's part of what makes the CMS fun uh, to drive, in my opinion. Uh, and th the main thing, though, is the styling. That's really it. I mean, that is what makes the CMS a CMS. It is beautiful to look at. And, uh, you know, I know there's going to be detractors. You're wrong. You're, ju <laughs> you're just wrong. Uh, this one again, 06 CMS 500 uh, Sport Package, 26,000 miles. Uh, you know, if you're going to collect one, if you're going to, you know, act this early to put one away, this isn't a bad one to choose. It's in Mercedes Signature Silver, black leather, good combo for a Benz, and uh, of course the very low miles. Um, and uh, otherwise, if you want to drive it, there's quite a bit of life left in it. So, uh, if you have an interest, give the guys at Auto House a call, 239-263-8500, on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, thank you so much for having a look. Really appreciate it. I'm going to... Uh, I might do, I don't know if I'll do the highway or not. We'll see how it looks. I'm a little bit later if it's bumpery to bumpery, then forget it. But uh, otherwise, um, I'll put that little bird video in the end so you can see what the little bastards did to me this morning. <sighs> there it is. Thanks for having a look. We appreciate it, and we will see you with the next one. Take care. Canadians, definitely.
so I want you to tell me that I'm paranoid. You know, oh, the birds, they're, they're good, they're cute, they're little sky squirrels, you know, they're nice, they don't have any malicious intent. Okay, this is the second time in one week, within three days, second time. Uh, this bird obviously has some severe gastrointestinal problems. Uh, While well, I'm waiting for Peter to photograph his car, they come by, there's no tree directly above, so they had to target this thing, and they swoop down and let it rip, like a friggin' B-52, right on the car. And, uh, and you tell me that I'm paranoid. Oh, Bill, you're paranoid. You really, you know, the birds, they mean you no harm. Yes, they do. And uh, I tell you what, I've got a marine magnum at home, okay? It's, uh, you know, it's the Remington, it's whatever the hell it is. I don't remember. It's the one that every cop on the planet has. Uh, 10 million cops can't be wrong uh, about that Remington shotgun. And I've got it. I'm going to get some bird shot, and, uh, you know, we're going to see what's what. Payback is a bitch, and that's what's going to happen out here. So you can hear them. You can hear those little sky rats running around. <sighs> anyway, there it is.